I'm pleased to welcome you back to another session of our online courses. Um, I'm very, very grateful for your attention and your continued participation in the course. Uh, thank you very much uh, for sending me your feedback uh, over these last couple of weeks for those who, to those who have. Uh, and please feel free to stay in touch with me if you have any concerns or face any particular constraints as we go through this uh, trying period in the um, history of the city of New York. Um, I'm grateful also to Max for uh, submitting his presentation to me, and that's posted online, focusing on the moving to opportunity um, experiment. What's important about this paper or this discussion that Max has initiated is that we have here an example of an explicit identification strategy that uh, is going to try to address some of the um, causal implications in this case of place on intergenerational mobility. So we began the course with, uh, just to recap, uh, discussing measurement uh, issues. We've dwelled uh, a little bit about the biases, the challenges, both measurement and data challenges, in getting an accurate estimate of some indicator of, of mobility. That was all conducted in a, in a statistical sense. Then we moved to a conversation about uh, theory to help structure ideas about how causality uh, may work. Uh, we've explored um, some hypotheses, uh, uh, particular hypotheses in, uh, as well. Um, but in a broad scope, we have a sense that um, family, labor market, and government policy should all play a role in understanding why intergenerational mobility might differ across space or across time. Um, um, but we also, from that, appreciate that just simply looking at the data, at uh, descriptions and portraits of the data, um, should be done with a certain amount of caution, caution before we can actually tell causal stories. And so as we proceed through the course, we will certainly refine our notion of theory and then hopefully illustrate at least a couple of cases in which researchers have been able to um, adopt particular identification strategies to, to outline um, the influence of some of those parameters we've studied, um, usually always in a particular national uh, context. So today I'd like to um, complement both Amon's discussion of the geography of intergenerational mobility and Max's um, conversation of a particular identification strategy by delving uh, into theory a little bit more uh, and to focus on how we might interpret, it, interpret differences across time or across space and the actual challenges that poses. Um, my own view is that looking across time can be really quite uh, challenging because so many variables are at play, so many causal variables that are at play, and also because the dynamics of our intergenerational measures may not be um, monotonic um, and they may not, might not reflect uh, some of the steady state assumptions that are built into the model. And that's sort of where I want to go in this conversation. So I guess this is what I was just trying to summarize. We were left with um, this um, equation in the particular model we developed for the intergenerational elasticity, where gamma is some indica indicator of um, the degree to which government policy is progressive, transferring income from the rich to the poor in a simple 
type of uh, flat, flat tax with the demigrant. So this is a measure of progressivity um, because the transfer side of this is universal, but uh, we take more money from the uh, rich to, to finance that, and that's what the gamma is telling us. Rho is a measure of the return to human capital, and we might think of that as a proxy for uh, labor market inequalities to the extent that which the returns to capital drive those inequalities. That's bringing in the labor market part of this. And the parameters theta and lambda um, both have to do with family, but also how family interacts with government policy. Theta reflecting the role of parental income on human capital investments in the child. That is certainly related to um, uh, family income and family capacities to make those investments, but it's also going to be reflected in the structure of social institutions that um, that determine human capital and the gradient between household uh, well-being and uh, investments in the child. Be that human capital, um, uh, health, um, education, other forms uh, of insurance, as well as geographic mobility for, the, for that matter, but usually it's taken as investments in education. And lambda is the degree of heritability of endowments, and these endowments are quote-unquote mechanically transmitted across generations given by this lambda parameter. And again, we offered some cautions on how to interpret those endowments um, being broader than just genetics. Genetics certainly being an aspect of that, but genes express themselves differently in different social contexts. Um, but even the Becker-Thomas paper goes so far as to put uh, family culture in, 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 in that land. So all of this is to sort of embody that Venn diagram that I showed you at the very beginning of the year, that labor markets, public policy, and families uh, all influence a degree of in intergenerational mobility. And we suggested last day as well that there could be considerable persistence in time depending upon multi-generational uh, influences. And there's no reason why uh, lambda, uh, or the endowments rather, be modeled as an AR1 that could have um, a much more uh, longer lags in it. An AR2 would make um, uh, the grandparents play a, a role in this as, uh, in addition to uh, just the parents. And also from this model, uh, we have some hints on another puzzle we're sort of exploring, uh, the nonlinearities of the intergenerational elasticity across the parental income distribution. And that's what the, um, the theta parameter uh, buys us, or rather leads to some hypotheses about nonlinearities. And we'll revisit that also uh, when we look at another paper by Gary Becker, actually a, a paper published after his, uh, his death that explicitly explores this. And I've hinted um, in a previous lecture on, um, uh, on some results that suggest that beta may be highly uh, nonlinear, uh, much more sticky at the top than at the bottom, and a certain pan pattern of stickiness in, be in between as well. Um, but we'll leave that for uh, future discussions. So what I want to uh, talk about today uh, are some natural questions, natural in the sense that they come quickly to policymakers and observers in this area. Has intergenerational mobility changed through time? Uh, we saw the Great Gatsby Curve some weeks ago, which was a cross-national comparison of mobility. But people are very quick also to put a temporal dimension onto that and suggest you might slide up the uh, Great Gatsby curve uh, if society uh, or labor markets in a society are becoming more and more uh, un unequal. But it still leaves open, really, how we should interpret any changes that we do observe and also how we should interpret differences across space. So this uh, multifaceted notion of causality um, makes us a bit cautious in just um, giving univariate interpretations to any trends we see or to any differences across uh, space. 
And I think we hinted that at, uh, about that uh, last time, at least in some of the comments to some of the uh, questions that were posted on the website. I should point out that Gregory Clark's controversial book, and I have stated this as well, almost as a hint for someone who wants to review this book as part of their assignments, um, uh, that uh, there's a great deal of, um, or a, a great lack of fluidity in intergenerational mobility across space and across time. And in fact, he goes, on, uh, goes so far as to say that the degree of intergenerational mobility measured in his version of what status is, is constant for all places and for all times. Um, so I, if you read that work, I want to raise a couple of cautions or um, you should be careful in thinking about his work and relating it to the research that up until now that we've been reviewing that has to do with uh, income mobility. He's defining status in somewhat broader context. And also, as always, we should look to the methods and the extent and data and the extent to which they um, condition or influence the results. And um, his results are, are based around uh, group effects where he uses um, surnames and, and looks at, at uh, uh, st status measured in terms of groups having similar surnames, in some cases rare surnames, where you can associate that with families across uh, 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 generations. But these grouping estimators have their own biases and concerns uh, with them. And actually Gary Solon has a nice paper in the Economic Journal that discusses some of these challenges as well. So read that book with interest, but also with a critical perspective. Um, the other thing I'd point out, in fact, that um, it's hard, and, and we'll review uh, some of this literature, it's hard to discern changes in the degree of intergenerational mobility over time, at, at, at least in the United States um, in the post-war, uh, World War II period. Uh, this is, um, obviously we're only touching on some aspects of the literature of intergenerational mobility. It's a fast and growing field. It has really picked up in the last 10 or 15 uh, uh, years. And economic historians have looked at earlier periods, those associated with the uh, transition from the 1800s to the 1900s as the United States was moving from an agricultural to an industrial society. There are good papers in the Economic Review um, uh, on that. Uh, Ferry and Long are, are, are some uh, references. Um, um, but always, uh, um, it's the nature and the quality of data that determine uh, both our challenges and our opportunities. Uh, some of these are income-based studies. Others are more occupational-based uh, studies. There is a strong literature in sociology as well uh, uh, on this um, that focuses on, um, on occupations and the status associated with occupations according to some measures. And the general feeling in that literature is also that there is more stasis than there is uh, change. Uh, Goldthorpe is a, is a name that you'd want to read. Uh, John Goldthorpe, or, although he's not so active uh, anymore, but he and um, Erickson are important names in, in the sociological literature on this. So let's um, review one paper that uses a methodology uh, and data that we are familiar with, uh, a paper by Gary Solon and his co-author, a former student of his, um, that goes back to the PSID and tries to um, pull uh, at it uh, um, at it as forcefully as it can by teasing out uh, um, results for multiple uh, uh, age cohorts and uh, different generations. Now I should say there are mixed messages in this evolving empirical uh, literature and I'll briefly point out a paper by Bashma Zunder that suggests that maybe intergenerational mobility has changed between an era of lower and higher mobility. And um, Bash has written a number of papers on that area. Um, 
partly I think the results in the Lee and Solon paper uh, reflect limited uh, sample size um, and um, it's really difficult to uh, discern uh, significant trends um, in the best of, of times. And so let's talk a little bit about that paper. The panel study of income dynamics, as you know, uh, is a longitudinal uh, study that began in the uh, 1960s. And they look at different um, birth cohorts, those born uh, in the 1950s all the way up to the mid-70s. Um, but the information is first starting to be collected in, in 1968. Uh, here the uh, uh, the eldest uh, group that they are going to study in 1968 uh, are 16 years of age. And then they focus on looking at adult income from the age of 25 uh, on, onward. And, and so you can sort of see the window that's available uh, to them. It's from the mid-70s to the 2000s, and people range in age from 25 to 48. What's different in this, um, in this paper, which was published in the Review of Economics and Statistics, um, is that the outcome is measured as family income, a little bit more similar to what Raj Chetty and Nathan Hendren are, are, uh, were using in the paper that we studied last week. Um, uh, so this has the advantage at, uh, of including uh, daughters into the analysis. So they want to do everything here. You can see how they're trying to meet the limitations of their data. They're trying to do everything to increase their, uh, their sample size, even if they have to give up a, a, a little bit of, of purity in the, uh, uh, the theoretical relationship of these uh, data. Uh, family income represents not only the transmission of human capital, which relates to skills, which relates to wage rates, and that's why we might focus on wage rates or earnings as our outcome, um, but it also brings in issues of uh, labor supply and uh, family formation. So it's not as, this outcome is not as tightly tied to the simple theoretical model that we've been exploring up until now. So these trends could have even broader, um, broader causes at work. But at any rate, we have about 1,200 sons and about a similar number of daughters uh, over this period of time, uh, which gives us uh, over 10,000 uh, actual person year observations that we're dealing with in this paper. And the method is just uh, least squares, trying to discern how the elasticity uh, varies for the different cohorts over time. Um, there's a couple of lines here. The thinner line just refers to the 30-year-olds, and that's very noisy. And then they have the, uh, the full sample. Uh, for uh, uh, This is just for sons. And the dotted lines refer to the, um, uh, the confidence interval around those estimates. And they're relatively uh, wide, although they find that the beta is around 0.44, which is sort of the prior uh, that we have in mind. Um, it's hard to discern in these results um, any trend at all in, 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 in these data. For daughters, there's a slightly different uh, perspective, although if you really take the standard errors uh, in, in, into account, and, and that might be a little bit more challenging to say, but at least with the point estimates, um, you see an upward drift in the intergenerational elasticity up until the 80s, and, and then that's flat. And that's uh, sort of interesting. There's, there's other research by um, Susan Mayer and Leonard Lopo that sort of focuses um, uh, on the impact of daughters, and they make an interesting point. Uh, policies that are arguably policies that enhance opportunity, think of limiting or lowering the degree of um, gender discrimination in the labor market or, or in the educational system for that matter, so that women now are, are able to um, exercise their talents, get uh, an education, 
that um, their uh, energies and talents um, uh, um, uh, govern that they should get as opposed to some sort of social construct or, or absolute constraints in their access to the education system. Uh, and if they get this, these skills and if the barriers in the labor market are also diminished, I think the first thing to ask is who are the first groups of women to benefit from that? And it might well be the daughters of relatively well-to-do families. And so that might be an explanation for the rise in the intergenerational elasticity <laughs> over time. As opportunities become more and more available to women, uh, it looks like the stickiness is increasing, at least over this short period. And I'm just hypothesizing here. I'm not suggesting that, that this is an explanation for the data. But um, if those opportunities become more available to, to daughters at the higher end of the income distribution, then we might see the elasticity rise in an era of actually increasing equality of opportunity. So just the point of this discussion is just a little caution, always an interpretation, and we'll emphasize that as we go on uh, and, and as we go on in, in this lecture. So the conclusion here is and these are the author's words, that the intergenerational elasticity hasn't changed dramatically, at least over the two decades that this paper um, um, was based upon. And, and they reflect here a little bit of surprise because, you know, they have this prior in mind, and, and they're articulating this before, um, before the relationship between inequality and generational mobility really became a, a hot issue um, before the Great Gatsby curve was proposed. Um, it's surprising because at the same time, inequality was going up all over this period, okay? So they're sort of saying like, like what, what, what gives? Uh, we shouldn't discount the fact that, you know, maybe the data has only so much power to discern uh, these trends, but that's sort of our puzzle in this lecture. What, what gives? As I suggested, well, there could be many other forces at work and some countervailing forces. Um, maybe there are policies that come into play that are mobility enhancing while inequality is increasing. Maybe family structure is becoming stronger and better, giving uh, all children a better chance while inequality is going up. So there are multiple forces uh, at work. And the other theme is, you know, maybe these aren't steady state um, values, and maybe there are much longer lags uh, in uh, this process that we should be aware of. But just to pour a little bit of oil onto the controversy, this is not the only study that looks at uh, mobility. Um, and Bash Mazunder, who is a researcher at the Federal Reserve in Chicago, has a series of papers on this, um, one more recent than uh, the one I cite here. If you look at the Chicago Fed working paper series, you can get access to Mazunder's uh, work, uh, where he uses different data sets to um, look at, uh, arguably with more power, uh, with larger sample size, um, to look at uh, intergenerational mobility before and after the rise of inequality. But in this particular chart, which I, uh, I take uh, from their work, they correlate the returns to college, which is the uh, solid line measured on the, um, on the uh, left axis. And this, they take this from some of um, Larry Katz's work, this um, historic um, uh, time series on the returns to uh, schooling. And they uh, correlate that with uh, estimates that they obtain um, using a different method and using uh, census uh, uh, data to the intergenerational elasticity. And sort of they are of the view, in fact, that in this era of higher inequality, if that's proxied by returns to education, the intergenerational elasticity is, 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 is rising.
So they have that model in mind as well when they're looking at, uh, at this. Um, and again, you might want to read this particular paper again uh, as an illustration of how we um, look to our data for guidance. We seek to maximize on its um, advantages, but we also seek to minimize any uh, uh, limitations uh, in the data. So a, a different method that looks um, at much larger sample sizes available from the, uh, the census. So the whole point of this, I think, is to um, highlight that this literature is in flux. And so the, another influential uh, paper is a short paper in the American Economic Review uh, by the Chetty Hendren team that came out at around the same time as the, um, the uh, uh, geography uh, uh, paper. Um, but here too, again, I mean, they they have uh, data that is really quite admirable with large sample sizes, the income tax data, and from that they're able to call some information also on college attendance. Um, but they don't have a long time series, and they try to piece things together in in different ways. Uh, they focus on uh, the rank rank correlation uh, for children at the age of thirty. Um, and they try to piece together <laughs> a, a, a longer uh, uh, time series. Uh, this is the birth year um, that comes from actual predictions of uh, patterns in college attendance. And uh, if you uh, accept this, again, we have a, a Solon, Lee Solon type of result of uh, a constant, in this case, rank rank uh, slope. Um, as you can see here, he, here's an example of we can try to do the best we can with the data we have. And this is published as a short paper in the American uh, Economic uh, Review. So how should we uh, interpret this? I've sort of hinted at, at some of these themes already. Um, my own view, if I can put on the table, is that without an explicit identification strategy, it's really hard to know what to make of uh, trends and differences in trends. Um, but we really need to understand the underlying process. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit ab about a paper that I admire about uh, by uh, Nybaum and Stuhler. But let me go through some of these uh, challenges. Uh, first, the challenge of correctly interpreting trends in intergenerational mobility. And as I alluded to, and this is why I began the, the lecture with a restatement of the factors that uh, influence beta, there's a whole host of factors determining intergenerational mobility, mobility and they, these may, may move in different directions. And it's also in that model, it's a standard economic framing uh, in the sense that we focus on comparative statics. And so comparing steady states, um, two economies that differ in only one parameter and have settled into an equilibrium, uh, it's not the same thing as charting movement between them, uh, which is what we're doing when we're going to the data on time series. And um, what we also get from an appreciation of the, um, of the modeling of the movement between steady states, there can quite reasonably be non-monotonic adjustments that last quite long, um, first increasing and then decreasing intergenerational mobility. Um, and so that's particularly challenged trying to relate some variable we think that we might cause mobility to the kinds of trends uh, we assume, be that in a labor market inequality or be it family structure or be it some measure of, of government policy. The system might experience a change in one of those causes, but it takes a long time for it to settle down to the uh, steady state and, and, and have that change fully work itself out. More than one generation is the argument. 
And so that's what Nyebaum and Stuhler are uh, talking about in this nice paper, um, part of which what I've got on your reading list is sort of the original uh, working paper version that goes on for some 50 or 60 uh, pages. Um, since that time, it's been split into a, uh, a couple of papers. Um, a small, neat one that's been published in the Review of Income and Wealth um, just last year is, um, focuses on their dynamic model. And the other parts of the paper are working their way through the uh, Journal of Political Economy. And there are long lags in publishing things in economics. Uh, but anyways, uh, here you have a, a stripped-down version of their model. Um, reading the working paper version, it's really quite eloquent and well-framed and prepares us uh, for other parts of our, our lectures. Um, um, but I'm just going to focus on the stripped-down version that they talk about. And, and, and these equations are already familiar uh, to you. This is the intergenerational transmission of endowments uh, through the heritability of endowment lambda. This is the investment in human capital, how it relates to those endowments, um, those children that are quote-unquote more capable, more skilled, more talented, more whatever, um, are more productive in um, producing human capital. Uh, but then again, there could be some constraint in the labor market, um, uh, in the capital market, so that current parental income also humans, uh, um, uh, produces human capital di directly. These things feed into a payoff function with a certain uh, return that influences the child income. What's different is they've added uh, this term, the parental income can directly influence the child's outcomes, uh, directly as opposed to this indirect channel through human capital. So we, we might think of phi here as a marker for um, uh, parental uh, influence in the extreme uh, nepotism. So the better paid your parents are, the more access you get to better paid jobs, however that, uh, that, that works. And so substituting these equations in uh, gets you equation six and beta reflects not only uh, the uh, parameters that uh, we're accustomed to, um, but also uh, but also the direct effect of parents. So this might be something that rubs up against our notions of meritocracy. All right. So this is, um, this is nepotism, if you will, if I can use that term. This is human capital. And here you see the concentration of advantage across generations through the endowment. So the presence of this term is going to slow down mobility even more. It's going to raise the, uh, the beta. Now they do a little experiment and just strip this down further. Um, the interesting thing about their paper is the actual human capital can, can be multidimensional and, and sort of we'll get to this when we start talking about different phases in a child's um, uh, life and different types of human capital, uh, the early years versus the school years versus the teen years and so on. Uh, but now we've just uh, brushed the human capital equation aside, and I'm just going to focus on endowments and on uh, the direct parental influence. So, in some sense, this is their marker of a non meritocratic society, and the extent to which Roe plays an influence, it's, reflects, it's saying that just talents determine outcome, and this is saying just parental background determines outcomes. All right. Um, and then they, they're able to um, uh, define beta uh, and iterate and define the changes in beta through successive generations. Okay? And so the, uh, and the point here is they don't want, they're modeling this in terms of a simultaneous difference equations. They don't want to solve, uh, they want to solve or examine the process to the steady state. And they do a couple of simulations, um, quote unquote, uh, um, experiments, if you will, 
uh, to sort of fix our, our, our ideas and give us a sense of what's going on, and then consider a move from a plutocratic to a meritocratic society. That is, if this coefficient weighs heavy, uh, we are in some sense in a plutocratic society, but if we eliminate that influence and let just talents shine, then we've moved to a meritocracy. And that's what they, uh, they do uh, here. Um, they look at um, a decrease in the impact of parental income and an increase in the returns to skill. So going along here through the generations, there comes a generation that then experiences a new type of labor market in which family background doesn't matter or matters less. And that generation uh, experiences more mobility. The intergenerational elasticity falls. But as we move through time, um, there is an actual upward increase in the inelasticity. Now there are groups that have made more money than they otherwise would have, and then that extra kick to their income is a benefit to their uh, children. So you've sort of skimmed off the, um, the most talented of the least advantaged families, given them opportunity, and then they reinforce that opportunity in the next generation, and the beta actually rises and settles down eventually into a, its steady state value. Lower than in the previous, but taking a non-monotonic path there. And this, in their model, spans um, three generations from the initial policy change. They also conduct these experiments for a decrease in the heritability of endowments, which is a much quicker mood, or an increase in rho um, in the returns to human capital, and that drags itself out for a long time. So um, what are we to make of this if we are going to take this theory to the data and to understand trends? So this more general model is telling us that there's going to be a slower movement uh, between, uh, uh, they have a more even more general model that talks about an even more slower uh, movement between steady states. Uh, if we were focusing on income and wealth as opposed to earnings, if we brought in the direct effects of, of grandparents. The point of this is past events events that may have been very large shocks uh, can have long lasting effects on intergenerational outcomes. So if you think of the Great Depression, or if you think of things like industrialization or large scale migration, you know, like we had in the United States um, between the 1800s and the 1900s, or um, the Great Migration of Blacks uh, uh, northward, or think of big policy uh, changes like the very significant expansion of access to schooling, both primary and high school uh, schooling, but also higher, edu uh, higher education through the uh, G GI Bill after the war in the United States. Like that GI Bill quite reasonably in the 1940s and 50s could still be working its way through <laughs> the intergenerational uh, process for generations uh, born uh, decades and decades after the um, uh, post-war veterans got higher education as a result of an increase uh, in their ability to access um, uh, 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 college as a result of the GI Bill. So just looking at cohorts born in the 60s, 70s, or 80s, uh, looking at them for a relatively short period of time, um, is may not be picking may not be picking up all of the dynamics, and 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 what we may be seeing in that generation um, may be the results of policies decades and decades earlier in their grandparents' time. 
Um, and also, if we want to focus on inequality to the extent to which that is proxied by the returns to education, it's going to work its way through more slowly across successive generations rather than immediately in the way that uh, simple comparisons of the Great Gatsby curve uh, uh, might, uh, might lead us to uh, suggest. Um, and more slowly than changes associated with the heritability of endowments. So I find this um, a rather interesting uh, paper that uh, gives us um, more caution or at least more tools in striving to interpret some of the results we see from, from time series. And it's one of the reasons why I'm sort of um, a little bit cautious about um, time series as a way of identifying uh, these results. As interesting as they are and as important as they are in the vocabulary of, of public policy, you know, with everybody talking about the decline of the American dream. Let me just say in closing a, um, a couple of words about the um, Chetty paper that we um, reviewed uh, last day. Um, uh, focus on Amon's presentation. I, I stress that this is a must-read uh, article, the Quarterly Journal of Economics uh, article. Uh, it illustrates the uh, the use of a substantially, for the United States, new source of, of data, uh, albeit that data still has its limitations, and that's why they focus on rank-based uh, uh, measures. Um, but the power to draw that uh, subnational portrait of the United States, I think, has really been uh, valuable. And in this paper, they don't go so far as to draw causal uh, stories or paint causal stories, but they do sort of start to hint at this uh, with their discussion of the uh, correlates of, of, of mobility. And this is why the transition to Max's paper is interesting. And, and, and these authors, uh, at least Chetty and Hendren, have been involved in writing a couple of other papers on, on, on neighborhood effects that have been really important um, using migration and sibling differences. So as we were working through the course, you should also be developing a sense of what are the possible identification strategies that have been or could be used uh, in this literature. Um, and we've seen a couple of them. Um, and, and Max discusses the most obvious is sort of run an experiment. And you're sort of lucky if you're involved in that. And, and intergenerationally, it's, um, it's something that's going to take long lags. Um, but what the authors of the Moving to Opportunity paper do is exploit the fact that that experiment happened some time ago and then they re revisited it decades later to pick, to pick up the impact of the kids. So we've talked about some of these results. The, uh, the rank rank slope is familiar and uh, this is contrasts the American results which are amazingly linear um, uh, with findings for Denmark and, and for Canada. Um, in the quarterly journal paper, they pulled these results from Canada from one of my earlier papers with uh, a co-author in which we uh, offered up information on deciles rather than percentiles. Uh, but obviously, having read um, my more recent co-authored paper, um, that information is available for percentiles now. And these big differences are there. So then the question becomes, why? What's going on? And they offer a, a number of correlates, and I thank Juliet for um, drawing our attention in her comments uh, to these. Um, in some tables in the paper, uh, and some of the results are just univariate correlations, but here they've got a multivariate uh, um, model. And they're trying to sort of, in the way they play out, play these, uh, play out, play the, this, these variables out, they're trying to hint uh, or more refined sort of a causal story or suggest next, uh, next steps. Um, they look at both their measure of what they call absolute upward mobility and also relative mobility. Again, remember, these are all in, 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 in ranks. And they have a bunch of um, 
characteristics for the commuting zones that they are studying. Uh, and each of these um, relate to one of the causal stories that they have in mind. And they explore a lot, many more variables, but they take sort of the, uh, the one that's most significant with each, within each of the themes. Uh, the fraction with a short commute, perhaps having something to say with neighbor about neighborhood market um, um, segregation. Um, the genie for the bottom 99 percent, uh, 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 the indicator that seems to bite for the inequality theme. The high school dropout rate as a measure of school quality, their index of social capital for sort of a measure of trust of community. and. Um, the fraction of single mothers in the commuting zone as the indicator for family structure. And again, you see how these might relate to, to our theory. When they uh, put all these variables in, in a multi-variate um, least squares regression over their, uh, their 709 commuting zones, um, the only things that uh, really seem to uh, bite in the sense of having uh, an important statistical significance are the uh, ones associated with their, their vision of neighborhoods or segregation and the one associated with family uh, structure. And that seems to be re robust to a number of specifications uh, of that, of that uh, model. What they point out in this column here is that when you remove the uh, the um, the demographic variable, the fraction of single um, mothers, um, the significance of these coefficients goes up. So it's as if this variable is capturing uh, the kind of variation that's important uh, in these things. And they also add the uh, fraction of the population that's black in the commuting zone to this. And the suggestion being that it's not so much um, ethnicity that, that matters, or race that matters, um, but actually family structure. So again, these aren't causal, and, and they're not claiming them to be. They're just sort of laying out in a, um, in a cautious and descriptive way potential hypotheses to explore in further studies. And that's what they do, and it's a good um, transition point for us, as I suggest we should start thinking more uh, about identification strategies, uh, refining our theory, uh, particularly now that we know that, or at least it's suggested that family plays a, a big role. Um, but you know, families interact with, uh, with other things, so um, what's causal in that is still all very important, but you know, maybe we should dig into the operation of the family is sort of the suggestion we're getting. And I think that's going to be a theme that, um, again, Juliet will, will uh, discuss uh, after the break. So um, let me leave you uh, with some questions that take us from the last lecture through this one and into the next. Um, um, we have not a sophisticated theory, but a, uh, a theory that, that, that has given us some categories to think about. Uh, certainly raised cautions in, in interpretation, right? Uh, uh, but also helped us to um, categorize potential forces. And so with that, I think um, we should interpret intergenerational mobility, how it evolves through time, uh, more cautious, uh, cautiously, uh, and the differences across space lead us to some hypotheses, both space within the country and between uh, countries. And so we need to explore uh, these differences uh, 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 a bit more. Uh, continue to refine our, refine our theory. We still have the issue of nonlinearities out there that we haven't addressed, uh, but refine our theory to give us a more sophisticated view of um, the impact of families and their interaction with uh, place. So with that, I want to thank you very much uh, for uh, your engagement. I'll look forward to your comments on the, uh, uh, on the uh, website. If you can make a particular point of uh, commenting on the student presentation, I'd appreciate that. So your reading of that moving to opportunity uh, paper. 
I do want to remind you of a couple of deadlines that are coming uh, forth. Um, I'm hoping that you will have your um, draft of your paper uh, to me um, uh, towards the end of class uh, uh, by uh, email. And then I will take a quick read of them and I will assign them out for the um, refereeing process and I will send, uh, send those out as soon as I can to the potential referees. We agreed, according to my reading of the course outline, that the referee would then send back his or her report to me by April 17th. And uh, I get all these things back to you um, uh, by our next meeting on April 23rd. So the referee reports are important. I'm going to be gauging the quality of your feedback. Um, I want you to offer people both critical but constructive uh, uh, feedback. And if your referee report um, fits those frames, I will also um, pass it on to uh, the author of the paper that you're assigned. Of course, no attribution, so your, your, uh, your classmate won't know who wrote the uh, referee report. Um, but it'll be, I think, very helpful if we have qu high quality uh, uh, referee reports. So it's just as another way of getting feedback to help improve these papers as you go into the final stretch and, and um, write up a final draft for, uh, to be submitted by the last day of class. So I look forward to your questions, comments, and concerns. And um, uh, to our interactions next time. I think it might be helpful if we perhaps planned a, uh, a virtual meeting uh, when we come back after the break just to touch bases uh, and we can conduct it simply as a, a type of question and answer period um, or an opportunity to exchange insights um, and just to see each other again. Um, that said, um, uh, you should all know that um, you are free to reach me by email and we can have a, a chat either through FaceTime or Skype or some other medium if you would find that helpful. And some of you are in fact doing that. So if you have a, a, or you think an opportunity to chat with me would be helpful, um, that's easy enough to arrange from my end. So um, I'll leave it up to you to do that. Otherwise, um, please keep taking good care of yourselves. I know that we're all going through uh, challenging times here, and I can appreciate that, uh, that life may um, throw certain curveballs at you, as it always does. Um, but, you know, perseverance is important, one step at a time, and uh, we'll get through the finish line. Uh, uh, and all the best to you.